To programmers who are new to the ID, dependency injection sounds like a serious, complex design pattern. I will show you it's actually a very simple ID, so that after this video, you can start using it right away. In simple terms, dependency injection is giving a dependency to the code that needs it. A dependency is defined as any code that's being used by other code. For example, via import statements, if you had two different files in your source code, then one is importing the other, that is a dependency of that code. This other code could be a function, a class, a module, could be anything. We know it's a dependency because we need to import it. It is from the code we are writing, it is seen as something different, it is other code. Giving a dependency to some code that needs it is what we call injection, that's why it's called dependency injection. If it's not given to the code, in for example an argument to a function call, but the code goes and imports the dependency itself, then it is not dependency injection. Let's look at some code to bring this to life. In this example, I've got a reducer function that imports an array, a util array. It's implemented over here, it's in a different file. It has a remove function that this code depends on. The reducer function, it doesn't matter what's in the add and the toggle in this case, this is where the dependency is being called. So we can say that this implementation depends on the remove function. It grabs it from the util array. When you import this directly, it is not dependency injection. If you would implement this in a different way, say for example, we would refactor this to a, a function that you have to call with the dependency, and then it would use that one, then it would be dependency injection. It's as simple as that. The act of giving the remove function as an argument to the reducer, that is dependency injection. Instead of the reducer that goes and imports its own dependencies, you get all kinds of advantages from this that we'll take a look at in this video. Let's look at an example with classes. I'm simulating three different files here. I have a controller in its own file, I have a MySQL connector in its own file, and I have some other file, the call site, that is using this controller. Right now, the controller is using a MySQL connector directly. It's creating, via the new keyword, an instance of the MySQL connector itself. MySQL connector is a dependency of the controller, and right now it's not being injected. It's used directly by the controller. The call site is only responsible for instantiating the controller and I'm calling its function. Refactoring this to dependency injection is, the is asking the question, how can I, this is a dependency, how can I inject this dependency? And it's fairly straightforward. You can simply move this call to the call site. Now, the call site is responsible for making a new instance of the MySQL connector, passing that to the controller and the controller is now only using this MySQL connector. It's not responsible to go and fetch that dependency itself anymore. Now I've shown a similar example in my video on coupling because this also decouples the controller from the connector. Now suddenly the controller is not depending on a specific MySQL connector anymore. It can just use any connector, it, any database connector is fine. If you want to move to another database connector or if you want to inject a fake database connector because you're running unit tests, this is all possible. Let's look at a more high level example. Imagine we're creating a video service. We have creators that can upload videos into their account and we have all other users who can watch their videos on all their different devices. Creators have the one highest possible resolution that they upload is one video file into the system and the system will start converting it to the different formats, resolutions and everything that all those different devices need. That's the problem we need to solve for. This is implemented with two different services in a manager worker architecture. The backend for frontend, the manager is responsible for creating new jobs and processing results. The worker is responsible for executing jobs, the video converter, it, uh, its job is creating lower resolutions of all those different file types and, and whatnot that the, all those devices need. And these two services communicate via a queue, specifically RabbitMQ. So the backend for frontend uh, puts a job on the job queue and the video converter, the worker, doesn't do anything until there's a job available for it. And whenever the worker is done with the job, it puts the result back on the results queue and the manager, the backend for frontend, can process that result, notify the user, hey, everything is done in terms of video conversion, you could release the video to users if you want to. Let's zoom into the manager, the backend for frontend, and let's look at a very naive implementation. There may be controllers in there, there's a specific video upload controller, which is currently responsible for connecting to RabbitMQ. RabbitMQ uses the AMQ key 
protocol, that's why it uses this lib to connect to it, to create a channel. And then whenever a video is uploaded by a user, then it can actually send that video to the queue which means it's then on, on the job queue and the workers can start to process it. This is how it's currently implemented. You can see again that we have two different concerns here. This video controller is both responsible for putting something on a queue and responsible for creating a connection to RabbitMQ specifically with all the credential code that may be in here. Now this is pseudocode, it's a very naive, simple example to be realistic. There's obviously more code to connecting to uh, RabbitMQ, there's more code to not simply pass a massive video file in the response body. This is not how uploads work in reality. But the principle still applies. There's two different concerns here. This video upload controller knows about the specifics to reconnect to RabbitMQ and it knows about the specifics to handle the upload and put something on a queue. Those we want to split out. When we're looking at this through the lens of dependency injection, the AMQP lib, so the RabbitMQ specifics, I would start to extract those out. This is what it could look like. I would just have a different RabbitMQ connector that can depend on that specific AMQP lib, that external dependency, uh, that handles the connection, that handles the specifics of that library. You need to call this send to queue method. And then our video upload controller can only focus on what matters for the controller itself. These are two separate concerns now. It means we're moving the responsibility to the call side. So now the call side needs to construct the video controller, but to be able to do that, it needs to construct the, the, the RabbitMQ connector first and pass that to the video up controller, inject that into the video upload controller. All I did was extract out this connect this RabbitMQ specific code. The video upload controller is still responsible for the stuff it was already doing. It is still pushing stuff on queue. It is still responding with an HTTP 204 maybe that it was already doing because those are controller responsibilities. Now after our effector, most of the code does not depend on RabbitMQ anymore. It's just generic code unaware of what's, what it's actually connecting to. Yes, it is depending on the ID of a queue, the concept of a queue, and it only needs a push method to be able to put things on the queue, but it does not depend on Rabbit anymore. That means if you want to move to Kafka, it's very easy to write a different connector. Or if you want to write a good unit test, it's very easy to write a fake connector so that your unit test does not actually need to go to the network. Finally, let's talk about what DI gives us. Dependency injection moves the responsibility of choosing an implementation to the call side. And an implementation simply means what dependency is used. In our controller example, we had a MySQL database, but the call side could just as easily have decided to inject a PostgreSQL database because that decision is now in the call side. The responsibility has moved. It can inject anything that satisfies a certain interface. It needed a query method. If it injects anything that has a query method, from the controller's perspective, it's fine. This decreases cognitive load. While implementing this controller, you don't want to have the details of this MySQL connector in your head at the same time. It also increases separation of concerns. The controller has a different thing to do than the MySQL connector or the RabbitMQ connector. It's better if those two different things are not intertwined in one file, but they're actually separated out. DI also gives us easier testing because your tests are also a call site. Those tests can decide to inject a fake implementation, one that does not actually connect to a database. And that's very nice, having your tests not depend on a network connection and actual database, because now you get less false negatives. If your test fails, you know that it's not your Wi-Fi being down or something like that, unrelated. No, it's actually your implementation that's being broken here. And this saves you a lot of time. With the earlier example, you may have thought, but why have the possibility to support different databases? I don't need different databases. I have a database and it's fine. Well, you do need different databases. Your tests use a different database, a fake database. But besides the fact that you never have just one implementation, another answer to that question is that it's not the only problem we're solving. We're actually structuring our code in a better way. We're deciding to depend on an interface instead of the details of an implementation. Coupling to interfaces instead of implementations is a very important principle in software engineering. And you might want to check out my video on loose coupling versus tight coupling if you want to learn more about that. And that's it. I hope this was useful. I hope you liked it. I'd like to hear from you in the comments now. Did I clear things up? Did I pick examples that were difficult to understand? Will you be able to use this knowledge right now? Please leave a comment and subscribe. Thank you very much for watching.